Hello, this is our first lecture on electrical circuits. In this lecture, we will cover the basic concepts of electricity, international standard units, linear systems, active and passive elements and the passivity convention, and resistors. What's an electrical circuit? An electrical circuit, also called as electrical network, is multiple elements connected in a closed path such that electrical current can flow. A very simple electrical circuit is shown here. We have a battery connected via a wire to a resistor, and the resistor is connected back to the battery with another wire closing the whole loop. Here, the resistor is the simplest circuit element, which is a two terminal device with terminals A and B through which a current can flow, and between A and B, we have a voltage or potential. Why do we need electrical circuits? Primarily for two purposes. Firstly, electrical circuits are used in the generation, transmission, and consumption of electrical power and energy. Secondly, it is electronics. Electrical circuits are used in the encoding, decoding, storage, retrieval, transmission, and processing of information. Electrical charge is the intrinsic property of matter responsible for electrical phenomena. The charge of one electron is minus 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Current I through a specific area is defined as the electric charge passing through this area per unit time. I is equal to dQ over dt. So if we take the time derivative of the charge, then we find current. The unit of electrical current is ampere. 1 ampere is equal to 1 coulomb divided by 1 second. Electrical current has a direction. Due to the convention, the direction of the electrical current is opposite to the flow of electrons. Here we have current I1 flowing from terminal A to terminal, terminal B, and here we have current I2 flowing from terminal B to terminal A. Accordingly, I1 is equal to minus I2. How do we compute the charge from currents? As we stated in the earlier slide, I is equal to dQ over dt. We need to take the integral of both sides. Accordingly, Q is equal to integral from minus infinity till t i d tau. If we start this integral from t0 instead of minus infinity, we need to also take into account the initial condition of charge at t is equal to t0. Accordingly, we add this term of qt0 to the equation. Let's find the charge for an element when it is equal to 40 squared minus 2t plus 5 amperes for t greater than or equal to 0 and the charge qt for t less than equal 0 is 0. So we will need to write the equation for q, which is equal to integral from minus infinity till t i t dt. But of course, we can write this from 0 to t i t dt plus q 0 as the initial condition. But we know that q 0 is equal to 0. Therefore, this can be written as an integral from 0 to t i dt. According to q of t is equal to integral from 0 to t 4t squared minus 2t plus 5 dt. If I take the integral, I end up with 4 times t to the third power divided by 3 minus t squared plus 5t and the unit of this will be in coulombs. So if I want to find the charge, I will need to plug in the correct t value to this equation. We can classify the currents in electrical circuits uh, into two categories, direct and alternating currents, DC and AC. In the direct current, the direction and the sign of the current uh, does not change. The current is usually a constant value. On the other hand, in the alternating current, the sign and the polarity of the current changes. 
So the current might be positive, then negative, positive again. And it might have different waveforms, but the most common one is the sinusoidal waveform due to the way we generate uh, electricity. In science and engineering, we are using SI units or international systems of units, which is also known as the metric system. There are seven base units and all physical phenomena can be measured in units, which are a combination of these. The seven base units are these. Length is measured by a meter with the symbol M. Mass is measured with kilograms with the symbol Kg. Time is measured with seconds with the symbol S. Electrical current with amperes with the symbol A. Temperature unit is Kelvin, which has the abbreviation K. The amount of substance is mole and it's abbreviated as MOL, moles. And the luminous intensity is measured with candelas with the abbreviation CD. The SI units are defined by seven defining constants, which have certain exact numerical values when expressed in terms of their SI units. For instance, uh, C is one of those constants, uh, which is the speed of light, and it is equal to 299,792,458 meters per second. Let us briefly touch the historical context of the SI units. The meter convention was signed in Paris on 20 May 1875 by 17 nations. The treaty created the International Bureau of Weights and Measures, which is an intergovernmental organization that coordinates international metrology and the development of metric system. Currently, most of the major countries in the world are signatories of the meter convention and here is the logo of the international bureau of uh, weights and measures which shows all the base units and defining constants all other physical units can be derived from the base asi units for instance linear acceleration is meter divided by second squared frequency is one over s and it is also denoted with hertz. Force is equal to kilogram times meter divided by second squared, and it has its own uh, symbol as newtons. Physical phenomena cover huge ranges. For instance, the output of a nuclear power station might be 6 billion watts. Instead of saying 6 billion watts, we simply say 6 gigawatts. That way it is much easier to understand and compare the numbers. Similarly, a capacitor might have 10 times 10 to the minus 12 uh, farads as its capacity. And instead of saying 10 times 10 to the minus 12, we simply sell 10 picofarads and that is much more understandable this way. Therefore, we are using these standard prefixes with the SI units. There are two fundamental variables in electrical circuits, current and voltage. Current is the flow of charge through the elements of the circuit, whereas voltage is the energy required to cause the charge to flow. The voltage between terminals A and B is denoted as VAB, and similarly the voltage between the terminals uh, B and A is denoted as VBA. VAB is equal to minus VBA. The voltage across an element is the work required to move a unit of positive charge from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. The units of voltage is volt, abbreviated with capital V. A charge of 1 coulomb delivers an energy of 1 joule as it moves through a potential of 1 volt. V is equal to the derivative of work with respect to the charge. Power is the time rate of expanding or absorbing energy. Mathematically, this can be denoted as P is equal to time derivative of work. The power is the product of voltage across an element times the current through that element. The unit of power is Watt abbreviated with capital W. P is equal to dV over dt. 
we can write this as dv over dq times dq over dt. As you know from the previous slide, dv over dq is equal to voltage V and dq over dt is equal to I. Therefore, P is equal to V times I. When the current enters the circuit element at the positive terminal and exits at the negative terminal, then terminal voltage and current are set to adhere to passive convention. In this way, power is absorbed by the element. If the current enters in the negative terminal and exits at the positive terminal, then power is supplied by the element. For instance, a resistor absorbs power and generates heat. Similarly, a battery or power supply supplies power to the remaining elements of the circuit. Consider the element shown below with the voltage is equal to 4 times e to the minus 2t volts and current is equal to 6 times e to the minus 2t amperes for t greater than or equal to 0. We need to find the power at t is equal to 2 and energy absorbed by this element until t is equal to 2 6 seconds. Now, an important keyword in this question is the word absorb. How do we know that the power is be, energy is being absorbed by the circuit? P of t is equal to V of t times I of t. Accordingly, it is 24 times e to the minus 4 t. And work as a function of time is equal to from 0 to t, p, T, D, T, and this will be equal to minus 6 e to the minus 4 T, 0 to T, and this is equal to minus 6 e to the minus 40 plus 6. And work till time is equal to 2 seconds is equal to minus 6 times e to the minus 8 plus 6 and when we use our calculator we get this as 5.98 joules and i can calculate power at t is equal to 2 seconds as 24 times e to the minus 8 and this is equal to 8 milliwatts M here denotes 10 to the power of minus 3. In engineering, we create mathematical models of systems to describe the quantitative behavior of the systems. Usually, we write differential equations to describe these system dynamics. There are both linear and nonlinear models, and indeed, nonlinear models can describe much richer dynamic properties. However, linear models are much easier to analyze compared to the nonlinear models. Linear elements satisfy two important properties, superposition and homogeneity. In the homogeneity property, multiplying the input of a linear device by a constant affects the output in the same way. In the superposition property, the net response at a given place and time caused by two or more inputs is the sum of the responses which would have been caused by each input individually. Let us look to the mathematical representation of superposition and homogeneity, the two fundamental properties of linear systems. Here, the arrow notation implies the transition from excitation to response, or in other words, from input to output. In the superposition property, if we apply I1 to the system, we get the output V1. And if we apply I2 to a system and we get the output V2, then if we apply I1 plus I2, we get as output the summation of the individual outputs of V1 and V2. Similarly, in the homogeneity property, if I apply I1 as an input and get the response V, then if I multiply this input by a constant k, then the response will be the output multiplied by that constant k as well. If a 
system satisfies both superposition and homogeneity properties, then that system is a linear system. Let's check whether some elements are linear or not. Let's start with a simple resistor with the constituent relationship V is equal to R times I. V1 is equal to R times I1. V2 is equal to R times I2. Let's assume that I apply the input I1 plus I2 to this circuit and V3 is equal to R times I1 plus I2, which is equal to R times I1 plus R times I2. As you can see, R times I1 is V1, R times I2 is V2, which is then this whole equation is equal to V1 plus V2. So basically, if I apply the input separately and at the output, it's equal to the both inputs being applied at the same time to the system. Therefore, the system is satisfying the superposition property. Now we need to check the system for another property. Let's assume that we apply to the system I1 and get again as output V1. Let us assume that we apply to the system the output, uh, the input out is equal to R times K times I1. So I basically multiply the input I1 with K. This is equal to K times V1. Therefore, multiplying the input with K multiplies the output with the same constant and therefore the system satisfies the homogeneity property as well. Since both conditions are satisfied, the system is linear. Let's see whether the element with the constituent relationship V is equal to I squared is linear or not. I apply I1 to the system and the output is I1 squared. Similarly, I apply I2 to the system and the output is I2 squared. I apply I1 plus I2 to the system and the output is I1 squared plus I2 squared plus 2 times I1 plus I2. I1 squared is V1. I2 squared is V2. However, I have an additional term here. Therefore, this is not equal to V1 plus V2. Therefore, uh, the superposition principle is not satisfied and the system is not linear. Now, let us look to this relationship. V is equal to I plus 3. Obviously, this looks like a line equation, and since it's a line equation, it should be a linear system. Hmm. Actually, this is somewhat tricky. Let's go through the math and see whether it is or not. V1 is equal to I1 plus 3. V2 is equal to I2 plus 3. Let's assume that I apply I1 plus I2 to the system as an input. The output would be I1 plus I2 plus 3. However, this is not equal to V1 plus V2, which is equal to I1 plus I2 plus 6. Therefore, superposition principle is not satisfied and the system is not linear. An element is passive if the total energy delivered to it from the rest of the circuit is always non-negative. Non-negative here means zero or positive. Then, for a passive element with the current flowing into the positive terminal, the following condition is true for all values of T. Energy is equal to an integral from minus infinity till T, V times I dT, and this value should be always greater than zero or equal to zero. In other words, a passive element absorbs energy. A passive element can also supply energy, but it can only supply the energy which it has already absorbed. For instance, a mechanical spring or in electrical circuits, a capacitor or inductor. On the other hand, an active element is capable of supplying energy to the circuit. The ability of a material to resist the flow of charge is called resistivity. It is denoted with the symbol rho. 
the units of resistivity is ohm meters and it is usually measured at 20 degrees Celsius, which is also called as room temperature. The silver has a very low resistivity, copper has a little bit more, aluminum has considerably higher, and iron, as you can see, has a very, very high resistivity. So iron by itself would not be a suitable material for making a cable. Copper, among all of these, is used most in the wires due to its low resistivity. Aluminum is also used frequently for power transmission lines because of its lower material density and also price. Aluminum is very abundant. We don't use silver even though it has a very low resistivity because silver costs considerably more. The resistance of an object with a uniform cross-sectional area A and length L is given by R is equal to rho times L divided by A. As you can see, if the resistivity increases, the resistance increases. If the length of that object, cable or wire increases, the resistivity increases. And if the cross-sectional area increases, then the resistance decreases. Ohm's law relates the current and voltage over a resistor. It is V is equal to R times I. The units of resistance is ohm, abbreviated by the capital omega. 1 ohm is equal to 1 volt divided by 1 ampere. Ohm's law can be written also as I is equal to G times V. G denotes conductance in the units of Siemens. In some of the textbooks, such as the art of electronics, you can see the practical engineers use Mo with an upside down omega for the units of conductance. If you go to the website of an electronics vendor, you will find thousands, if not millions, of different types of resistors. In the laboratory, for making simple circuits on breadboards, we use metal film resistors. In power engineering, especially for current sensing applications, we are using wire-wound ceramic resistors. If you open an old computer, you will find resistors array in this form, where between different legs of this resistor array, you will measure different resistance values. Most of our smartphones, uh, due to miniaturization needs, uh, use surface mount components. These are tiny compared to these other types of resistors, surface mount. And for human machine interaction, variable linear resistors are used in order to understand the position of a slider. Similarly, in robotics, for measuring the joint angles of a robot, we use sometimes variable rotary resistors, which are also called potentiometers. Similarly, in a circuit, in order to adjust some of the parameters, sometimes we use POTS as well. We can use the color codes on metal film resistors to understand their values and also some other properties such as tolerance and temperature coefficient. For instance, in a 4 band resistor, the First band uh, denotes the tens, the second band denotes the ones, third band is the multiplier, and fourth band is the tolerance value. For instance, let's look at this uh, example. The first band is red, red corresponds to two. The second band is purple, purple corresponds to seven, so I have 27. Third band is uh, orange which corresponds to the multiplier 1000. So the value of this resistor is 27,000, which can be abbreviated as 27K. And the last band denotes the tolerance value, and the color is gold. Gold means the tolerance is 5%. In other words, uh, the value of this resistor might be up to 5% higher or lower than the 27k value denoted nominally. 
why don't we use one percent uh, tolerance value for all applications? Because with the tighter tolerances, the price of the resistance resistor increases, and we don't need that much precision in most of the applications. <laughs> 